Hi, everybody. My name is Neela Jacques. I'm a director in our product marketing team focused on enterprise cloud computing. In this session, we're going to be covering what's new with the cloud director. In terms of the agenda, there are four major things that I'm going to talk about. We're going to start with a high-level overview of what we are doing with the vCloud initiative. And then we're going to dive into the technology. And I've broken that out into really two pieces. On the first side, we're going to take off our IT hat and put on the hat of the business. We're going to talk a little bit about what are the needs of the business and how does this translate to specific technology. Then we're going to put our IT hats back on and talk about what it is that we need to do to transform the infrastructure that we have into a cloud infrastructure that delivers on the demands of the business. Finally, I know that hybrid cloud is a major area of interest for many of you, and so I'll spend some time talking a little bit about both the vision as well as some of the technology VMware has been delivering to be able to uh, deliver on that. So without further ado, let's jump into it. As I mentioned, we should start by talking about the overall concept context of the VMware vCloud initiative. To begin with, I want to highlight a shift that we're seeing in the relationship between IT and the business. For a long time, we have seen the IT organization represented by the CIO really being asked to deliver more, but really with fewer and fewer resources. From a virtualization standpoint, consolidation has very much been one of the key drivers of a lot of the activities that we've been seeing out there. At the same time, however, we continue to hear from the business that the CIO serves a desire and a need for IT to deliver significantly more than it has in the past, to really support the business in innovating, in changing, and fundamentally to be more agile. And so we're in the past, very much, there was the CIO was being pushed to be more efficient while the CEO was asking for greater agility. What we're now seeing is that that relationship is, is shifting such that that demand of, of agility is increasingly being asked to be delivered by IT in the present. Internally, we often use the term supplier and consumer of IT. And really, I think that that, that helps show that, that relationship is moving from one where IT has very much just been a cost center for the business, to one where it is now a key strategic partner. And what is being demanded of IT is to deliver IT as a service, delivering the right service at the right price so that the business is able to have the right capability at the right time, leading to increased competitive advantage. So what we're seeing is a huge shift from, the, from a focus on just cost cutting to now greater agility. And in fact, what we've, I've seen lots and lots of surveys that are out there. And what every survey seems to show is that the top driver for cloud computing is, in fact, agility. Uh, cost cutting is, uh, is obviously still there around. But the business is asking, how can we get more agility in, out of the business? And the answer for many organizations is build a cloud environment. So let's define cloud. What, what are we talking about when we say cloud? And I'm not going to give you VMware's definition of cloud. Let's actually look at uh, something that a government entity has actually come up with. The NISD is a, is a national standards body. And when they talk about cloud, they talk about cloud in three ways. They first start by talking about deployment models. And they talk, uh, I think at least three of these should be familiar to you, but they talk about a public cloud, a private cloud, which is on your own premise, a hybrid cloud, which is a mix, obviously, of public and private, and this thing called a community cloud. A community cloud is a cloud that is made for a set of individuals, often in the same industry, um, who share a set of, uh, of technical requirements. The second major area that the NIST talks about is three major delivery models, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. If you'll excuse me using an analogy here, for those of you not familiar with these three terms, I think about it as uh, getting a meal. There are three ways you can get a meal. You can show up at a restaurant, get takeout, and have your meal completely created. That is software as a service. The end user consumes the full good. On the other side of the spectrum, I can rent a kitchen 
that has nothing in it, nothing in the pantry, nothing in the fridge. I'm just renting the infrastructure. In this case, this is infrastructure as a service. But, but there is a model in between. The model in between is that I'm renting a kitchen, but that has a fully stocked fridge and a full pantry, so that I have every ingredient that I want, although I have to assemble them together into a meal. This is platform as a service. We'll come back to this in a second. The NIST also talks about five essential characteristics of cloud. Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't other things that are desirable in a cloud, but these are the five things that must exist for, for something to be called a cloud. And they are broad network access, rapid elasticity, measured service, on-demand self-service, and finally resource pooling. If an infrastructure or an environment does not have all five of those, the NIC does not consider them a cloud. Now, why am I telling you all of this? VMware is the only company that addresses all three of the delivery models, also that offers all five in a true way of these essential characteristics. The specific, the big difference between us and other companies, or one of the key differences, is that we're the only company that offers true pooling with virtual data centers, and we'll talk more about that. And then finally, in terms of the deployment models, where some companies talk about the way of the future is public cloud, and other companies say, no, 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 it's all about private clouds. We're, we're the only company that's going out there and saying, no, it's not about one or the other. It's about both. In fact, in the, in the language of NIST, we believe and are key in helping all four of those. On the community cloud, you may have recently heard about the New York Stock Exchange building a community cloud for the financial services industry and doing that with VMware. And so now that we've defined terms, let's go and stock, start talking a little bit about VMware's technology. As I mentioned, VMware has been investing for a long time in being able to deliver infrastructure as a service. And when we talk about cloud, obviously cloud begins with virtualization. The NIST talked about pooling of infrastructure for us, but it's done by vSphere virtualization. While the NIST doesn't say it's required, I certainly think it is important to have a, to have a secure and compliant cloud for you to have a cloud that you actually want to use. So this is a critical part of what we think is necessary to deliver a good private cloud. There are two other elements, however. Certainly in building a cloud, you want a cloud that you're able to manage. And so vCenter management technology is a key part of delivering a cloud. But really the key, the capstone, uh, the key piece of technology required to have a private cloud uh, is in the area of cloud consumption. And this is where we'll be talking much more around vCloud Director and some of the new things coming out with vCloud Director 1.5. As I mentioned though, the, uh, VMware is not just focused on the private cloud. We believe that both the private and the public cloud are models uh, that will be expanding over time and that you will want to leverage. As a result, the leading public cloud providers in the world are building their public clouds, their enterprise class public clouds, on the same VMware stack, on the same VMware technology. And this means that you now have portability such that you can start and start a workload say, in the private cloud, move it to the public cloud, and move it back. When we talk about enabling portability, we talk really about two things. One of them is around cross-cloud standards. Having an open API is critical, as well as having an open format for your virtual machines and your applications to facilitate the movement back and forth. But the open format is really only the first step. The other piece is around cross-cloud management. So we'll talk in the last section about some of the technology VMware is delivering to help you to move and to manage workloads across both uh, private and public cloud. It is only when those two are working seamlessly with each other that you can say that you, in fact, have a hybrid cloud. I know some of you aren't as familiar with vCloud Director, so before we, we go in and dive in too deep, I, I did want to give a quick overview of it. Uh, vCloud Director is a product that sits on top of the virtualization layer. In fact, what it does is it builds on top of vSphere and scales up to 10,000 VM and 25 vCenter servers. 
the main thing that it does is it creates something called a virtual data center. And it's pooling the underlying resources that exist in vSphere into these new units of consumption. And we're going to go over that in a little more detail a little later in the presentation. There's a huge part of this which is around security, uh, leveraging vShield technology, having role-based access controls, but then also providing self-service portals to provide self-service or on-demand infrastructure to those people who most need it in the business. In, it, in order to do this in a, in a way that works across a very varied a set of needs around a varied organization, we'll, we're isolating users into organizations that have unique catalogs, policies, as well as LDAP. And then finally, as I talked about, we have an API that enables not only cloud portability, but also integration with other tools that you're building or third parties are building, as well as orchestration of key tasks. So with that overview, let's actually dive in a little more. So as I said, I wanted to begin by taking a step back from the technology. And I wanted us to take off our IT hats for a second and put on our business hats. And so let's start by talking a little bit about what we're seeing happening in the business. One of the key things that we're seeing is that there are folks in many organizations, here we call them developers, but people who are uh, innov helping the business innovate to meet some of these changing needs that are out there. And what we're seeing is that they have a desire and, frankly, a need for greater agility. We're seeing in company after company that you have somebody that says, hey, I need a new app. That trickles down to a set of folks who are going to go out and build that app, either from scratch or from third-party software. Now, what are their needs? Immediately, there's a question of, I just need to get some capacity now. I want to get started as fast as possible. And I want to make sure that I can simulate production so that when we go in production, we know it's going to run flawlessly immediately. Obviously, once it's in production, there are a whole set of, set of needs that are there. How do I plan for my capacity? What do I place it on? Uh, obviously, how do I set up the security, the firewall, and all of those? Now, in many cases, what we see is that internal IT struggles to be able to deliver on the agility that these users are most often asking for. And so often they're saying, hey, could I have a LAMP stack? Yet uh, they get bogged down in a set of queues. Maybe they need to spend a lot of time justifying why it is that they want it. Maybe simply just sits in the queue and they have to, to remind folks to get, to get access. One thing that we've been seeing, and this is in fact quite scary for a lot of IT shops, is that people are going around IT and going straight to things like Amazon EC2. Now that has some major concerns, obviously, to uh, the CIO who has concerns around security and compliance, performance and SLAs, availability and data protection as well as intellectual property. You know, another, another way of looking, looking at it, and I think this is sort of a nice little aside, is to look at what is it that, uh, what is it that our VMware administrators are spending so much of their time doing right now. It's interesting that, in fact, test dev users, uh, other kinds of low governance users, whether, it, whether they be uh, training workloads or infrastructure testing or demonstrations or things like that, that these things are in fact provisioned significantly more often than any other workload in their environment. In fact, we've gone and looked at the data with it, that we have within VMware and found that over 75%, three quarters of provisioning requests are for non-production things. Uh, part of the reason is there's still quite a lot. The, the place you started virtualizing, in fact, wasn't your production application. It was a lot of your pre-production. But the second piece is that those kinds of workloads tend to be provisioned many, many more times, uh, much more frequently than your production workloads, as you need to, to test the same thing in multiple configurations, for example. And on average, about three quarters of your typical VMware administrator's time is spent on supporting these kinds of workloads. So how do we solve it? The solution is for IT to become a service provider, and we talked about that before. So what we're going to go through is talk about self-service is a piece of it. It's not going to be appropriate for every workload and everyone, but it's a great start for being able to tackle that set of users that we are first talking about. We'll talk about catalogs and we'll talk about virtual data centers. So let's dive 
right into this. So the first step in being able to deliver on this agility that the business is looking for in a more efficient way is to first sit down with the users and understand what are the needs and bucketize those needs. Here I have Java stacks, databases on Linux, or whatever. Think also about what are the, what are the hardware needs, what is being asked most often. Putting those together into a catalog of applications or of the app. The next thing, though, is to ask, well, are those users just one large block, or are they segmented into separate logical groups? You know, one simple thing is to look in your organization and say, do you know, do you have uh, people like Charlie and Jim? Charlie and Jim today have their own infrastructure, whether it be pre-virtualized, so uh, physical infrastructure, or even maybe uh, they've, they've got their own vSphere cluster but they really don't want to share. They're afraid of having other people around. They don't want to see somebody else's VMs. So thinking about what are those logical groups, maybe they're two separate organizations. We have government departments, for example, where it's very simple. It's two different departments uh, or legal organizations. Or if it's simply just two groups of people who work on very different projects, um, certainly it could be test dev on one side and production on the other, for example. And what and what we want to do is be able to split those groups from a logical perspective. We'll talk about in a little bit. However, on the back end, we do want to make sure that they're able to, to physically share resources. So you're really looking for the best of both worlds here. The technical term that is used to describe an environment that does this, that logically separates but pools on the back end, is a multi-tenant uh, infrastructure. And since VMware's technology was built both for private cloud and public cloud, this concept of multi-tenancy was built uh, at the heart of the cloud director. The next step is to start thinking about the actual resources that you have. And again, here we're thinking about the business. And so we're looking at it from the perspective of, you know, what, what are the questions? What are the needs that are often asked when we're looking to, to deploy a new application? In the old world, we have, you know, at a gross level, a one-size-fits-all. However, then we go into an immediate customization of, well, let me ask you some questions and, and tweak uh, what I can deliver to you based on those needs that you have. Well, where we want to move to is a concept of virtual data centers, where you think about taking your, uh, the resources that you deliver and bucketizing it into something, say, gold, silver, and bronze. I had a, uh, a customer who were working on, on a case study, and he was telling me that uh, they do statistical analysis. Um, and in the statistical analysis, they require tremendous amounts of horsepower on the, uh, on, the computing, on the compute side. And as a result, every year they're buying the fastest, latest hardware that they can get. And so in their organization, when they think about gold, gold what gold is actually changes. It changes every year. Gold is whatever the fastest stuff that we, uh, that we have. Bronze, for them, becomes there are cases where they're doing analysis and it's not about horsepower. I just need it to be cheap. And so what they've done is that for them, their bronze are things that are older hardware that have uh, they've been almost fully depreciated. And people are saying, hey, it doesn't have to run fast. Just give me as much of it as you, as you can spare. We'll talk about this concept a little more, a little more later. Um, one important thing is I don't necessarily need to have all of those resources controlled on my own on premise on my own premises. And so what we're seeing is people looking to say either immediately or potentially over time, taking one of those tiers or a piece of those tiers and having them actually hosted uh, offsite with a service provider. And so in this example that you see here, we've taken silver and we've put that at the service provider. All right, so the, the last piece that I want to talk about, and often this is the biggest concern, when I start talking about self-service, people often ask, well, but if it's free, aren't I going to get VM sprawl? Aren't I going to get too much demand uh, for the services that are out there? So the first one I want to point out is self-service doesn't actually need to be uh, full self-service to an individual. Self-service really could be on demand. It could be somebody in IT who is a business partner um, who is prov uh, provisioning. But let's set that aside for a second. What else can we do to make sure that we don't get too much demand? Well, one hint comes to what we see when we're using external service providers. 
the thing that stops people um, from calling, say, a Verizon or Rackspace and saying, I want a million servers is obviously they cost money. And so what we want to start doing is attaching a price to, say, my gold and my bronze resources. And having a price there, as well as actually measuring and tracking the usage, that goes a long way to starting to change people's, people's actual behavior. In fact, it's interesting, chargeback is an area that often uh, scares people because they say you know, chargeback is, is, can be really difficult and complicated to do. What we have found at VMware is that you do not need to get to 100% accuracy and full chargeback to start changing behavior. That simply putting a price on something and giving somebody a report, something that's called showback in the industry, that is often enough to change the bulk of the behavior that you're looking to affect. Um, and that even if we can't get an exact right price, even a, a price that everybody knows is wrong, that still gives people an order of magnitude and changes behaviors. As I mentioned, in many cases, people are going to start uh, delivering cloud computing to a specific, specific set of users and for a specific set of workloads. In many cases, the people who are most clamoring for it are the developers and the, the uh, test and dev organization, the developers in your organization. One of the key things that becomes very useful is being able to have a shared vApp catalog. So what we see is that here, in this case, a developer might build a uh, VM, might build an application and put it into a shared catalog. That catalog then can be pulled by the testing organization, worked on, and then brought back to the, uh, to the shared VApp catalog. A key part of the cloud infrastructure is obviously that uh, resources are able to be accessed very, very quickly. And so let me spend a, a few minutes talking about that. So the first thing is there are many different ways that you can provide access to resources. Obviously, one simple one is there's the GUI. You, you're providing a set of users with web-based portals by which uh, they're able to get access to the resources they want. But that's not the only way. You can certainly integrate it into IT workflows and, and request processes, right? So if you already have a, if you already have a system um, where someone goes into, uh, say, a help desk system where someone goes into to, to request resources, you could potentially have that be connected into your vCloud director environment. Um, so that it then uh, kicks off the request process and a, and a VM then gets created to serve uh, that request. Another thing is that you can provide developers the ability to access the cloud via an API call. And so, for example, we had a, a software developer who was looking to do an application that needed to scale very dynamically. Most of the time, you only needed a couple of VMs. Some of the time, however, you might need 15. And so in their case, they're able to write the application so the application says, assume there's a cloud back there. And so when it needs to, it'll go ahead and spin up new VMs and it's able to load balance across them. Another key piece of delivering, um, of delivering resources fast is, is being driven by a piece of technology called fast provisioning with link clones. This is something that people have been asking us for very much. You'll see it's in fact new with, uh, with version 1.5. Two real benefits of this technology. The first one is often when people want a workload, they want it immediately. They don't want to have to wait for you to copy an, an existing workload or template that you have in the system. With link clones, what we're doing is that rather than creating a full copy, we're only going to save the deltas. And so we have one primary image, and then I can have 10 copies of them, and they are linked clones, meaning the only thing that I save is what changes rather than saving the overall image. And so, obviously, as I, as I mentioned, you're able to get your VM deployed very quickly. But as important for a lot of folks is the, are the storage savings that you get out of that, that you are able then to have, say, uh, a tester who needs to test 10 different uh, slight tweaks, slight versions of, uh, of the same thing. Instead of having 10 copies of that VM, you only have one copy with a few of the deltas uh, that are saved there. Uh, what we found, and third parties have estimated, it's about a 60%, more than 60% uh, storage cost on average of doing this. The last thing is, in terms of accessing resource fast, it's often a question around, um, well, what about on the networking side? 
do I, if I want to have three copies of the exact same VM, do I have to go out and change, for example, the IP addresses? Is that going to make an issue? Am I really testing the VM that I want to be testing? Well, we, in fact, provide instant network out isolation. We, we are providing uh, the ability to have a ring fence around, uh, around either a VM or a collection of VMs, such that I could have three VMs with the exact same IP addresses, and we'll take care of things like the natting. All right. So that's really the business perspective, right? It's changing from one where they're having to go through and request from a human being, be at the mercy of sitting in queues, to being able to provide resources on demand to support their agility. If that's really what they want, now let's talk about what do we need to do to transform our infrastructure to be able uh, to deliver on this. Um, I imagine you probably had a lot of questions when I started talking about a virtual data center. What the heck is this? What is vCloud Director actually doing? Well, here's where we get into these details. So as hopefully most of you are familiar with, um, VMware vSphere is taking physical resources and creating virtual uh, equivalencies of these virtualized resources. The challenge has been um, that things like resource pools, data, data stores, and port groups, uh, these, these assets are still tightly linked to the physical asset. And for someone to deploy a VM, they need to make decisions on which resource pool, which data store, which port groups. Um, and that can be a little painful at times. It also means that, unfortunately, there are only a few people in the organization that are able to deliver a VM. Because there's only those people who have knowledge and the ability to answer those questions. What vCloud Director does is it takes these resource pools, data stores, and port groups, and it pre-allocates them into this thing called a provider virtual data center. And so here what we've done is we've actually tiered our resources. We have a gold, a silver, and a bronze. We don't define it, you do. If you want to have six different types, you can do that. Now here when we're talking about the provider, we're thinking about you as IT. These are managed uh, by you. You get this change over time. You can, have, uh, you can change out uh, which arrays are supporting gold as your needs, as your needs adapt. But by having these provider virtual data centers, this is what allows us to now serve the business via this thing we now called an organization. As I mentioned, this is a truly multi-tenant environment. And so I, as I take my users, map them to specific organizations, see I've called them marketing and finance, I can then take pieces of my provider virtual data centers and I can carve them up and provide them to the organization. I can also create catalogs that are unique to a specific organization or that are shared across both organizations. What this means, therefore, is that when someone wants to deploy a VM, they then simply pick which organization virtual data center, which virtual data center to them they deploy to, and their VMs are then deployed into that. Those resources can be uh, guaranteed to them or I can make some intelligent choices as to uh, who is able to oversubscribe. I, I can make it that only the provider, only IT can do that, or I can delegate that to someone who's an administrator for that organization. Now, obviously, security has to be a critical part of this, to be able to have a shared infrastructure by two organizations that, frankly, could be completely separate. We have a number of cases in which, um, instead of being marketing and finance, it could be a joint venture that is an organization that has to be, from a legal perspective, completely isolated. So security has to be a critical part of that. And so I want to talk about what we're doing on the security side. Well, the first thing that we're doing is that we're virtualizing common network services, such as NATing and DHCP. The second thing that we're doing is that we're protecting the VM regardless of where it is. On, with vShield Endpoint, we're protecting individual VMs with offloaded antivirus. Where it gets even neater, however, is that with vShield App, what we're doing is we're creating trust zones across VMs. So you can think of that as being an entire application has a security ring fence around it. Finally, we're protecting the edge of, a, of the data center with vShield Edge. 
And what we're doing is here we've got port-level stateful firewalls. One of the key differences between our approach to security and maybe some of the existing physical, physical appliances that have existed in the past is that our new approach to security is much more agile. And in fact, it is aware that you're running in a cloud and that a cloud is dynamic such that it, your security profiles remain intact as your cloud resources, in fact, shift. Now, when we talk about security, it's not just about securing the VMs, but it's also about being able to get our compliance officer on board. And so with vCenter Configuration Manager, you now have the option of adding a very rich compliance environment, being able to have policies uh, that are built from out-of-the-box compliant templates. So regardless of if SOX or HIPAA or CIS, uh, if you're, regardless of if those are the policies that you have to abide by, we're going to be able to, uh, to recognize, you're going to be able to select those and look at your environment and say, are you compliant? And if not, what do you need to do to become compliant? allowing you to really build these golden images and standards and stay in compliance. Now, why should you trust us? I mean, obviously, uh, VMware historically has been, uh, has been a company that has been trusted very much so on the vSphere side. But I want to point out that even here with our, with our cloud efforts, we're seeing some of, the, some of the most challenging customers from a security standpoint in fact, choosing VMware. A great example is the Los Alamos National Labs. If, you, if you're not familiar with them, these are, the, these are the labs where the nuclear bomb, in fact, uh, was initially de uh, developed. And as you can imagine, security is critical uh, to them, a critical importance. And so they wanted to make sure that they were able to have security at every level. In some cases, they may have multiple defense contractors working. They wanted to make sure the users only saw what users wanted to see. That different projects could be segregated from each other. This was something that they were thrilled when they saw that the Shield app, in fact, delivered a lot of what they were looking for. Specifically, being able to have zones, that was critical uh, to them. W what did the entire environment meant, mean for them? Well, they were able to dramatically reduce provisioning time. Right? They were able to go from 30 days on average with, with v VM requests sitting in lots of queues down to about 30 minutes. They also found so while they, there was that agility piece, there was also some significantly lower cost as they're able to replace hardware appliances with virtual appliances. I've talked a little bit about this concept of uh, multi-tenancy. Let me uh, spend a few more moments touching on it. Uh, so secure multi-tenancy is something I think uh, people don't, often, don't necessarily think about immediately. Really, one of the key things in being able to have a multi-tenancy is being able to, to say to your end user groups uh, and to get them on board, to be able to, uh, to have them trust you that they can, in fact, be using shared resources, but that they will be guaranteed the resources that they want. Often, one of the top concerns is something we call the noisy neighbor problem, which is what if another VM, uh, what if another VM tries to steal my resources? Well, this technology is architected in such a way that you don't have to worry about that. Because we've arch architected that you're able to give each organization a set of guaranteed resources, theirs and theirs only. Often you see some other folks who say, they don't, well, because they don't have the, the ability to do this, they say, well, we'll offer multi-tenancy, and the way we're going to do this is by offering you air gap silos. And they take what is, in fact, a shortcoming of the technology, and they try and present it as a, as a strength. And they say, ah, we make sure that you, ha you have real security by keeping, uh, keeping each of your organizations on dedicated hardware. The problem is that, you know, that seems fine in the short term you're not able to get the ultimate pooling. And so by not pooling the underlying resources, you're not getting cost savings that you want. You're also not getting the benefit, the agility benefits of pooling. In our, in, in our case, because we're able to pool the resources on the back end while keeping that logical isolation, that full secure logical isolation at the organization level, we're able to maximize the consolidation ratios, maximize 
uh, the agility without compromise without the compromises that have existed in the past. Another area I find that a lot of people like very much when they dig under the covers of this technology is what we're doing at the at the networking level. As you probably know, what what we've been doing for many, many years right now is having to be very manual in what we do with networking. In the past it was in terms of actually moving physical cables around. Now what now what happens is it has moved virtual, which makes it a little easier, but unfortunately is the demand for workloads, especially vir virtual workloads, has exploded. We're finding that IT admins and, then, and their networking counterparts have to spend a lot of time creating VLANs, recreating VLANs, connecting VLANs to VNs, and so on and so forth. And not only do we have VLAN sprawl, but it just actually takes a lot of manual effort. In this world, however, we're doing things very differently. What we're doing is pre-populating these, these networking resources, such as they're there and able to be used automatically. We've created much more automation and delivery of networking resources, therefore making it much more agile, but also lowering the amount of uh, time and OPEX that your business is incurring. Another area that I wanted to uh, double-click a little more on that I started to talk about is extensions of notifications and APIs to enable third-party integrations. One of the areas, maybe not immediately, but we get a lot of questions about uh, that over time, I want to build a cloud that doesn't necessarily just stand alone, but that I can connect with my existing systems. What, what is VMware doing to enable that? As I started to talk about earlier, there are in fact a lot of things that we're doing to support that. It begins with the vCloud API that I mentioned. And one thing that I want to uh, point out there is that almost anything that a human being can do in the UI you can control via an API command. This was, in fact, a major design criteria for the product. Other things, though, that I want to mention is that we have a plugin for vCenter Orchestrator. And so almost anything that exists that, you, that a human being can do can be orchestrated through this uh, rich orchestration platform. We do have a plugin for VMware Service Manager, uh, meaning you have a rich service management product that you can leverage there also. We have extensions and notification interfaces so that you're able to be monitored by other systems and you're able to communicate both inbound and outbound uh, to these systems. You're also able to put in in-guest agents. That's not a problem at all. Um, and then finally, you have an ability to configure other, other systems to be able to interact so that, for example, I can have another system launch an action plan, pass it on to us, will do something, we can in fact pause while we wait for another system to do something, say to update a, update a record, or we can keep going with whatever task that we're in the middle of doing. Um, so this is often very useful if uh, you have some, uh, some tracking. For example, the government often wants to be able after certain tasks to, to go ahead and make some log entries, and we can certainly deal with that. A number of companies are integrating with us. Here is a sample of companies. This is just a sample. There are many others. Uh, that are in fact leveraging the vCloud API and integrating with us. See this in the bottom left-hand corner. All right, so we've talked about the consumption side. We've also talked about the delivery, how you transform your infrastructure to deliver a cloud. Let's now spend a little bit of time talking about bridging the cloud with a hybrid cloud. The first key piece of technology that I want to, uh, that I want to point out is is as we've talked about, one of the big desires in terms of hybrid cloud is being able to have the active movement of VMs back and forth between on-premise and off-premise. One of the key pieces of technology that we're delivering is to, uh, the ability to have a secure VPN connection between virtual data centers in your private cloud and in your public cloud. Let me take a second to talk a little bit about about public clouds, because thus far we've really been talking and assuming, um, assuming that you're looking at building a cloud within your own environment. But while you've been doing that, we in fact have a huge number of service providers out there that have been working to take uh, their hosted services and turn those in, into a cloud. It's important to realize that really the who's who of the service provider market has in fact turned to VMware. As, as their key technology partners. There are over 4,000 today vCloud infrastructures of service partner. And if you look at this, is a, uh, this is the Gartner Magic Quadrant. Well, they have plotted a bunch of the, uh, 
of the most successful clouds out there, if you look at the ones that they have put in the leader squadron, all five of them are working with VMware. Four of them have a uh, public have built their public cloud on VMware technology, and the fifth one is in fact uh, leveraging a lot of VMware technology. The only one um, on there, and we circled it in yellow, the only one that has not built the technology around VMware uh, is Amazon EC2. Really, they've taken an approach of uh, going for really a commodity cloud, the lowest common denominator, uh, lower SLAs as you keep reading in the news uh, about sites that have relied on Amazon EC2 going down. Let me spend a little time going to some more details into what our cloud providers are doing. But before I do that, I do want to point out that while this presentation is really focused around the infrastructure side of the business. There's certainly more to cloud than just infrastructure as a service. And in fact, VMware is one of the leading companies in working on platform as a service. We've got the Cloud Foundry effort that you've probably heard about that is an open source, uh, an open source effort that's out there. But then other major players like Salesforce.com and Google have in fact turned to VMware to help make their, uh, their platform as a service offerings uh, more open. But back to the infrastructure as a service, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the different classes of service providers that you might see out there. There are two that I, that I want to point out. So, well, I, obviously, there are 4,000 companies, and many, they're all doing different things, and they're all finding their own ways to differentiate. One of the things that we've heard from our customers is it can be a little challenging sometimes to to try and make sense of who's doing what and what's appropriate for me. And so VMware has got two badge offerings that can be helpful. On one side is something called vCloud Express. You can think of that as the closest thing out there to an Amazon EC2 that is based on VMware technology. The target market for vCloud Express is a, is a developer, is the actual end user. It's for people who want to go to a cloud swipe their credit card and get a VM very quickly. Um, the big difference between vCloud Express and something like Amazon EC2 is it is based on VMware vSphere technology. And so there is a, there's a uh, level of SLAs that's likely to be higher than you would get uh, with Amazon EC2. So lowest cost, but with very high QoS. That's the way to think about it. On the other side, vCloud Data Center Services is very different. It is aimed at a corporate IT department wanting to offer a public alternative to Amazon EC2. Really, the environment that the vCloud Data Center Services partners are delivering are ones that are very, very similar to what you are building in your own private cloud. And so here, this is for someone looking for guaranteed quality of service, that there's a certification by VMware that, that they are building or they, they have built this cloud based on VMware's reference architecture that security and compliance technologies have been uh, deployed and delivered. And again, uh, are working with VMware and architected to a very high standard. And then finally, that there's a commitment to workload, workload mobility across providers. What we've heard is it's not only very important for you to be able to move a workload back and forth between your private cloud and the public cloud, you also want the option, if your public cloud isn't delivering on everything that you want, to be able to switch from one public cloud provided to another. These partners have committed to enabling that. I want to talk about, next what I want to do is talk about one key piece of technology um, that we have built to really facilitate this cross-cloud mobility. It is called the vCloud Connector. And what the vCloud Connector does is it's starting to deliver those pieces of technology that are most important to being able to make these disparate, these disparate clouds, whether they be two private clouds in your environment, a private cloud and a public cloud, or even between a couple public cloud, making them much more as one. What it provides is the ability to see VNs, VATs, and templates across private and public clouds or across multiple private clouds. It's delivered as a vSphere client plugin, and it also provides the, an easy way to migrate a workload from one cloud to another. Often what we've seen is people start to use this internally, uh, internally, kind of like instead of having a P to V tool, you can, you can think of this as a V to C tool or a C to C, uh, a C to C tool. 
Now, obviously, again, because it's from VMware, security is built right to the heart of this, and, uh, and it's something that you can very much trust. So with that, we've talked about a lot of things, uh, a lot of things that are new. I do want to point out a couple things for those of you familiar already with VMware. I know a couple common questions uh, that we've been getting is around uh, what databases are supported, uh, some of these details. Um, I think people have uh, people have heard the rumor that SQL is uh, is a supported database with uh, version 1.5. Uh, that is in fact correct, and there, there are in fact a number of other uh, other cool cool little things like that that uh, people have been asking us about for the last uh, few months. So feel free to to ask some of those uh, detailed questions either here or uh, or later to uh, your VMware representative. I want to. Uh, to invite all of you certainly to come and hear more about this and other technologies at VMworld, at the Venetian in Las Vegas, August 29th through September 1st, or at the Bella Center in uh, Copenhagen in October. Thank you very much, and have a great rest of your day.